It's my uh, privilege this morning to, to speak about uh, the, what I've called the Book and Oat Fontaine and the Kruger Farmhouses, history, heritage, and the path to blue plaque recognition. There we go. And that's the view uh, looking up the road towards the, the Kruger Farmhouses. You can just see the, the biggest of the, the farmhouses right just above the road there. Firstly, just to tell you a little bit about the farm Buchenhout Fontaine. Um, this area was uh, settled by the Boers probably in about 1840. Uh, this would have been one of the first farms to, to be laid out. Um, interestingly enough, uh, there it is on uh, Jeppe's map of the Transvaal, which was uh, published in 1898. Most of the Boer farms were about 3,000 Morgan in size, which is about 2,500 hectares. Uh, Buchenhout Fontaine is, is significantly bigger than that. Uh, it was 4,280 Morgan, which is more like 3,500 hectares. And it would be interesting to know how that happened. I, I don't have an answer for you. So it was a big farm. Um, the first owner of the farm, Buchenhout Fontaine, and of course, this area for hundreds of years had, had belonged to the, the Buffer King. Um, but once the, the Boers had driven the, the Matabili out of this area, they, they took possession of the land and laid out the farms. Um, so the first Boer owner of the farm uh, apparently was a man by the name of Rudolf Bronkhorst. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple of other maps. Um, so there, th this is a map from the Surveyor General's Office of the Transvaal in 1913. And you can see Buchenhout Fontaine quite clearly there. Uh, interesting, you'll see on the left the Eightfallgrond uh, on the top of the Michalisberg. Um, and uh, the, the, the main road that ran from Rustenburg up to the Pilonsberg, uh, crossing over uh, on the, uh, the eastern side of the farm, and the, the current R565 follows a, quite a similar path. So this is the modern 1 in 50,000 map. But uh, I have outlined the farm in red. You can see the boundaries there. But uh, of course, what we are really interested in is the, uh, the Kruger farmhouses specifically. So if I just zoom in there, uh, you can see the hotel marked Kedar Heritage Lodge. Uh, you can see the copy. Uh, and then just above that, uh, you can see the, the Kruger farmhouses marked. Uh, and with the indication that Buchenhout Fontaine was declared as a national monument uh, and the date given is 1873. Um, okay, so the first owner of the farm, uh, Rudolf Bronkhorst, uh, sold the farm uh, in 1859 uh, to a certain Mr. Erasmus, and he in turn sold the farm in 1862 uh, to Paul Kruger, and we'll talk a little bit about more, uh, more about that. Um, we are hugely indebted to the Afrikaans historian Gustav Preller, uh, for preserving knowledge about these Kruger farmhouses. Uh, they were basically destroyed during the South African War. Uh, certainly burnt, uh, roofs removed, broken down. Um, but Gustav Preller found a drawing uh, which had been made probably in the mid-1870s by a German traveler. We, all we know of him is he was called A. Dearden. And uh, this drawing was published in a, a Dutch magazine and Prella found it, and uh, it, it gives us a lot of valuable information about what these uh, farmhouses looked like. Uh, Prella then published uh, this in the, 19, uh, in the Brandwach in 1921, another magazine. Um, and uh, this, uh, this drawing has helped hugely uh, with the, the restoration of the farmhouses, which of course was done by the uh, Simon van der Stel Foundation and a little bit more about that later. Okay, so you have the four farmhouses in a row, uh, the Bronkhorst house, then the, the main big Kruger house, uh, then, as you can see in the picture there, on the left, the first Kruger house, and out of picture, and in fact it wouldn't have been built when this drawing was originally made, is the Peter Kruger house. Those are the four farmhouses. So let's talk first about the, uh, the Bronkhorst house, which is the one with the red arrow pointing to it that you see there. Um, it's a very simple house. It was made uh, from, 
from sun-dried mud bricks. They were not fired in a furnace. Uh, the plaster is, is simply red clay, uh, no paint. Uh, there's no window glass. Uh, the house was probably built in about 1840, and of course in those days there was no window glass available in the Transvaal. And uh, when you see the house, you will realize this wasn't only built to be a house, it was built to be a fort. Uh, it's a very solidly built construction, thick walls, uh, wooden shutters on the windows. Uh, just three rooms, uh, essentially a living room, a kitchen, and a bedroom, and that's it. Um, it has a very simple uh, fireplace from the period in, in the kitchen. Um, uh, and wherever possible, the, the three of the houses are accessible to the public uh, on, on the tour. It's the Broncos house, the first Kruger house, and then the main, the second Kruger house. Wherever possible, they have been furnished with, uh, with items that are appropriate uh, to the period. Um, so that's the, the Broncos house. Okay, let's talk now about Paul Kruger. So remember, uh, Paul Kruger uh, bought the farm Buchenhout Fontaine in 1862. Uh, this is the earliest known photograph that we have of Paul Kruger. This is probably taken uh, more or less in the mid-1850s, when he was about 30 years old. Uh, he had, of course, come up to this area with the, the Furtrecker group led by Hendrik Porthitter. Um, when he uh, was 16 in the year 1842, he was given two farms, uh, Waterkloof, which is sort of between Rustenburg and Olifant's Neck to the south, and Bavianskrantz, which is a farm up on the Michalisberg itself. Also in 1852, he married his first wife, Maria Duplessis. Uh, she uh, very sadly passed away in 1846. Uh, the following year, 1847, Paul Kruger married her cousin, Gesine Duplessis. Uh, and she was a very, very strong woman. Uh, she had 16 children uh, with Paul Kruger, which was, uh, it was a big fan. There were quite a few of them who died uh, very young, uh, some of them in, in infancy, I suppose, just a, a sign of the times. So this photograph, about the mid-1850s, um, and they, they lived initially on the farm of uh, Waterkloof. Um, there's a picture of a young Gesine Kruger. Most of the photographs you see of, of her in her old age, I thought this was an interesting one of her as a, as a younger woman. So we've talked about the, uh, the Bronkhorst house briefly uh, from about 1840, this very simple pioneer house. Uh, we're going to move on now to the, the first Kruger house, which was probably built uh, in the year that Paul Kruger bought this farm, which was 1862. Um, that's what it looked like before restoration. I'm going to talk a little bit about how the, the process came about. Uh, but again, fortunately, we had the drawing by the traveller, Dearden, uh, which gave a, a better indication of, of what that first Kruger house looked like. So Paul Kruger uh, did very well. Uh, he became a, a prosperous farmer, a hunter. Uh, he uh, was a military man. He became the commandant of the Rustenburg commander. He was rewarded in various ways for military service. Um, and so in 1862, he decided to buy this farm, Buchenhout Fontaine, as well. Uh, just talking about the name, there is a, a very good stream that rises in the Michalisberg on one side of the farm and flows through it. Uh, I've walked near the headwaters of the stream. There are quite a few Buchenhout trees there. So it's understandable that it was called Buchenhout Fontaine. This is the, uh, the first Kruger house in its restored state. Uh, this house, as I say, 1862, uh, very typical of other uh, farmhouses of the period. Um, high ceilings, a thatched roof, reed ceiling, which is excellent for insulation. So for the Rustenburg climate, uh, this was the, the ideal way to build a farmhouse. Uh, basically cool in summer, warm in winter. Again, thick walls. Uh, this one, now there's, there's glass available. So uh, that's uh, progress compared to the Bronkhorst house. An interesting feature of it is the uh, peach pip and cow dung floor. Uh, very, very durable kind of, of floor material. I'm not sure that I would want to walk on it barefoot first thing in the morning. But uh, it is, it's uh, still there, this, this peach pip and cow dung floor. Um, so this is 1862. Right, moving on. Paul Kruger. 
becomes a prosperous farmer. Uh, this picture, uh, taken apparently 1864, he's now commandant of the, uh, uh, the Rustenburg commando. He continues to, to prosper, become wealthier. And in 1873, uh, he decides to build a much bigger house. And uh, by now, uh, he is commandant general of the Zadafrikaanse Republic. This photograph probably taken in uh, 1872 shortly before he commences this, this grand uh, building project. Uh, there it is on Dearden's drawing. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, th this house, and it's, it's a, it was a double-story house. The, the, the top floor was just for storage. It was just a storage attic. Nobody ever lived up there. But there were very, very few double-story farmhouses in the, the Transvaal. But it is very typical of houses from the Craddock district in the, the Northeastern Cape. And that, of course, is where Paul Kruger grew up. But he was 10 years old when he left there. So it is interesting to me that uh, when the time came that he could build the house that he really wanted, he went way back to his childhood, to those, those big fl double-story, flat-roofed uh, farmhouses that he remembered uh, from when he was growing up in the Northeastern Cape. Now, this was the challenge. Believe it or not, this is what that house looked like before resta the restoration commenced. The restoration, as I say, was done by the Simon van der Staal Foundation. Uh, the farmhouses were restored in 1977, uh, and then in 1982, the, the, the restoration on the old schoolroom was done. Um, and uh, essentially what happened is there was a major fundraising effort uh, the, what had happened after Paul Kruger's death is the portion of the farm that the farmhouses are located on was inherited by his son, Peter Kruger. Um, Peter Kruger died in 1911. Uh, he also had a son named Peter Kruger. Uh, he then inherited that portion and he, he lived until 1971. Uh, but with, his, with the death of uh, Peter Kruger, the grandson of Paul Kruger in 1971, uh, there was a major fundraising effort, and the, the land and the farmhouses were purchased, uh, handed over to the Simon van der Staal Foundation, and they then commenced the restoration. Um, and this is what they had to work with for the main house. The, uh, the top floor had been demolished, completely removed. Uh, this, this stoop had been constructed all the way around, but again, fortunately, there was the drawing of, of Dearden. Uh, Gustav Preller himself had visited in 1904, uh, and he in fact also provided very uh, useful information. Uh, he had taken the measurements of the house, the, 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 the length, the breadth, the height of it, um, and, but it, it was a difficult restoration. Uh, they, the, the, the restorers had to look very carefully for traces of where the doors and the windows had originally been uh, and those kind of details. There it is restored. It, it's a grand house, uh, this uh, double story, but still has a clan cowdung floor. The, the roof trusses are Buchenhout from the local area and when you're inside, please have a look at how they are joined together with, with wooden dowels and they bound together with, with rimpies. So this is still very much traditional uh, kind of, of building uh, techniques going on. And um, no inside bathroom. Um, I believe, I think Paul, uh, Sarah Paul Kruger's bath is in reception, isn't it? Yes, he literally had a big tin bath. Um, there was no bathroom uh, in the house. But the scale certainly was grand. And um, there were some touches which were somewhat more sophisticated. Um, this is the, the restored uh, living room of the house. Um, and uh, of particular interest is the, the wallpaper. And I, I have a very strong suspicion that Hesina had something to do with this. Uh, I don't think Paul Kruger was out there picking out wallpaper. But uh, Hesina, uh, her hand is seen in the house as well. And when the restoration was being done, traces of this wallpaper uh, were found uh, on the, the walls. And uh, the restorers had uh, the wallpaper remanufactured according to the, the correct pattern in, in the Netherlands, which is presumably where it came from in the first place. Another interesting detail is this is the, the main bedroom. 
The walls are painted this dark blue color. Uh, I have heard that it was thought to keep insects away, specifically mosquitoes. Up on the hillside behind the house uh, is this, this rock chair that uh, Paul Kruger constructed for himself where every morning when he was on the farm, uh, he would go up on the, to the copy behind the house to, to pray. Um, the memorial there was erected in, in 1957. Uh, there was something called the Lenta School in Rustenburg. I don't know terribly much about that. Uh, but it certainly makes the point that for, for Afrikaans heritage, this is, a, this is a sacred spot. Paul Kruger, of course, became president of the Zed Afrikaans Republic in 1883 uh, and then moved to the, the house in, in Church Square in Pretoria, but still used to come through to Book and Hout Fontaine uh, from time to time. But his period of sort of continuous residence here uh, ended in 1883. And there's the Paul Kruger that we are a lot more familiar with. Uh, so this is taken on the, 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 the front stoop of the house in Pretoria when he was president. So he moved off the farm. Uh, there's Hesina, as we are far more used to, to seeing her in her old age. Um, and the farm was then left in the care of Paul Kruger's son, Peter Kruger. Um, and he decided to build himself a farmhouse. So this is farmhouse number four. Um, and again, very, th this is very typical of the sort of late Victorian period. The house, this house is probably built in about 1890. Um, corrugated iron roof. Uh, this sort of more elaborate kind of lattice work on the, the front stoop. So we now have four farmhouses, each of them in a different architectural style and from a different time period. It really is, it's, it's, it's a unique site. Um, it's, it's an amazing uh, heritage site to, to have these, these four very different farmhouses all together. Um, the last of the buildings, uh, the old schoolroom. This was probably also built in about uh, 1890 just to serve as a farm school. And the, the records indicate that it continued to be used as a school up until about 1915. Again, this is before the restoration. And not surprisingly, it was, uh, you, you, you wouldn't waste a building like this. It was used as a storeroom. It was used as a garage. Um, but uh, that's how it looked once the Simon von der Stel Foundation had finished with the the restoration. Uh, Paul Kruger had a dam in front, in, in, on the front side of the farmyard. So Simon von der Stel Foundation acquires the property in 1971. Uh, the buildings are restored. The farmhouses 1977, old schoolroom in 1982. Uh, they published a, an extremely useful booklet in 1983. It was compiled by a lady by the name of Elise Labuskachny. And very much of what I'm telling you this morning is, is uh, I'm depending heavily on that booklet. And some of the, the photographs are from there as well. But unfortunately, the Simon van der Stel Foundation ran into financial difficulties and they had to sell the property. And fortunately, uh, Robert Forsyth saw the, the heritage significance and importance uh, of the property and of the farmhouses. And Robert bought the piece of land on which the farmhouses uh, stand and uh, Robert looked after the farmhouses and now Sarah continues uh, to, to do that as well. Um, and uh, that, this really was the beginnings of Kedar Heritage Lodge. Uh, Robert bought that piece of Book and Note Fontaine and then he started buying other pieces. Um, as I say, the farm originally was about three and a half thousand hectares. Um, Sarah, I think it's now about 480, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so um, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the farm is actually, was originally east of the, the main road, but, but Robert made it his mission to try and buy up as much of the original Buchenhout Fontaine farm as he could. Um, and so fortunately, uh, uh, even though the Van der Stel Foundation had to, to sell, the, sell the land, it, it came into the hands of Robert Forsyth and he looked after uh, these buildings. So back to 2018, uh, we managed to get funding from the, the National Lotteries Commission uh, to, to renovate the old schoolroom. Uh, so that's what it looked like once that was completed. And also to, to make it more suitable for use as a venue for tour groups and specifically for, 
for school tours. And so uh, the lotto uh, paid for the uh, clay and cow dung floor to be restored. They paid for these wooden benches. Uh, we put in information panels around the inside about the history of Rustenburg. Uh, we have some original artworks by the late Bill McGill as well. Um, and uh, so once again, it can fulfill its function uh, as a schoolroom. So that's really the history part of it. And if I can be a little bit simplistic, okay. Um, history, basically what actually happened, what were the facts. Uh, heritage, my understanding would be the significance of that history for later generations, later groups of people. Um, and I'm going to just talk very briefly about the, the blue plaques. Um, Robert approached the Michalisburg Association for Cultural and Heritage uh, early in 2019 and asked for a blue plaque uh, for each of the, the five, five uh, buildings at Book and Fontaine. And, and we had absolutely no hesitation in, um, in agreeing that there should be blue plaques on these, these buildings. Uh, as, as MACH, Michalisburg Association, we're very fortunate. We have a very carefully thought out set of blue plaque uh, guidelines that were written for us by Vincent Carruthers. And Vincent sets a very high standard, but we felt strongly that these houses uh, warranted uh, blue plaques. And uh, our procedure is, if someone, if someone approaches us for a blue plaque, it must be assessed, uh, it must be agreed, there is historical value there. Um, and then we always try and have an official unveiling ceremony. Uh, we feel that that's important for blue plaques. We, we need to make a song and a dance about them. Um, and it's a good opportunity to just generate publicity uh, to these, these significant heritage places. And then every blue plaque that's issued by Mach also has a certificate of authorization, uh, which, which confirms that uh, Mach has awarded the blue plaque and uh, cites sources. Uh, there's an assessor. Uh, there's the signature of the, the current Mach chairman. Uh, for these, of course, it was Mike Ben. And then that certificate as part of the ceremony is handed over to the, uh, the owner of the property. So there you see Mike handing the certificate over to Robert. That must have been the one for the Peter Kruger House standing in front of that. Uh, and we had a speaker for each of those five blue plaques. Uh, I'm sure you, you recognize uh, some of the, the, the people in that, that photograph. It was a momentous occasion. So that was our process as Mach for awarding blue plaques uh, to these uh, Kruger farmhouses. And uh, really just to conclude by saying this is a unique uh, heritage site. Um, it's, uh, it's wonderful that these farmhouses have been preserved. Uh, they are accessible to the public for tours. Uh, it was totally right that they should be honoured with blue plaques. And uh, we, uh, we look forward to Book and Hope Fontaine and the Kruger farmhouses being uh, preserved and accessible to the public for generations to come. Thank you very much.